Well, um, good afternoon. I think we should get started. So um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm John Thompson. I'm the president of NORC, something that I really enjoy doing. Um, so a little background. In 1941, NORC was formed in Denver by a man named Harry Field. And the idea was that the government and um, people making decisions needed to have real scientific information about what the opinions and thoughts were of the American people. Um, and so at that point, NORC was founded with a mission of doing important research in the public good. Now, and now I'm a little hazy on this. For some reason, in 1946, NORC left Denver and moved to Chicago. Now, you can speculate that maybe in the mid-40s, Denver wasn't the best place to be doing social science research, and the University of Chicago was probably much more attractive. Um, but I, I really don't know what, what the thinking was there. Um, so since 1946, we've had a really close affiliation with the University of Chicago. And today, um, our, our strategic goal is to be viewed as one of the leaders in the social science research field. And we really have two tr um, important resources that we use to um, get there. One of them is um, the fact that we have always had and we continue to have um, a really high quality, creative, inventive staff. And so we want to keep growing that and nurturing it. And the other one is, is that we've always been very fortunate to have a strong affiliation and partnership with the University of Chicago. Um, at some point, and we may do this down here, but in, in our, our loop offices, we have one wall that has all of the projects that NORC um, ever did. And um, it's, it's impressive to look at, well, almost, well, we haven't put the most recent ones on, but, um, and it's a very impressive to look at, and you can see all the good work that, that we have done with the University of Chicago. So. This is our 70th anniversary. We had the opportunity to um, renovate our space, um, again, in close cooperation with the university. And so we thought that it was time that we um, opened up our space, had an open house, and had people come over from the university campus, a uh, community rather, and look at what NORC um, has become um, so we can further our collaborations. And we also are very blessed that we have um, Rob Sampson here, and to introduce Rob, we're also very fortunate that we have the provost, Tom Rosenbaum. Thank you, John. It's really a great pleasure to welcome everyone here. Um, can you hear me? Um, the, uh, uh, in my introductory remarks before I have the pleasure to introduce our speaker, I, I was just going to say a few things, and I thought, well, maybe all I need to say is one word, data. But I, I thought I'd elaborate just a little bit, which is uh, really why it's such a pleasure to have you here at the University of Chicago and to have NORC continuing and upgrading and expanding uh, its linkages to the university. Um, it's really a discriminating advantage for our researchers, for NORC researchers, to collaborate in a way that one collects unique data and is able to make important statements about those implications for important broad societal problems. Um, and what I found so impressive with NORC, having the privilege now of sitting on the board for a few years, is to see not only the dedication to the collection of the data per se, but the thinking in a broad sense of where the field is going, of what the new techniques are that are necessary to develop data that's meaningful, and their commitment to carrying the brand, if you will, of their history of the university's pursuit of knowledge in a way that people understand what we're about. And uh, it's with that uh, appreciation and confidence in the future that I'm looking forward to the opportunity for mixing our organizations even better and to seeing some of the new work that uh, NORC is doing. Um, emblematic of this devotion to data um, is, to, is uh, the subject of today's talk. Um, 
The, uh, our speaker, uh, Rob Sampson, is familiar to many, being a uh, longtime faculty member at the University of Chicago and from some misbegotten way, uh, now located as the Henry Ford II Professor of Social Sciences at Harvard University and senior advisor in the social sciences at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. Um, he will, uh, the University of Chicago Press uh, will publish 15 years worth of analysis of data and insight in terms of the project on human development in Chicago neighborhoods in which uh, Professor Sampson has served as uh, the scientific director. This is a uh, combination, as you know, of a NORC project and NORC project and uh, one in which um, the cementing Professor Sampson's standing as one of the leading sociologists in the nation on crime and urban communities. So it was with that uh, intro that we are delighted to welcome you and most particularly happy to welcome back to our community, Professor Sampson. Thank you, uh, Professor. It's a great pleasure uh, to be back among uh, many friends, uh, former colleagues, and to uh, explore actually the new space here at NORC. Um, I got in, walked upstairs, and I barely recognized the place. Of course, as soon as I leave, they renovate it. I had a <laughs> um, dusty, musty old office somewhere in the corner. Um, so maybe if you give me one of those offices back, um, uh, we'll see. Um, <laughs> the U of C and uh, Nork are, are really a special um, place in many ways. They're, they were special to me. I, I, time flies. I spent, I think, 12 years here on the faculty. And uh, I miss it a lot. And as a now outsider, I, I can say that some of the special qualities of the place, which I would uh, simply characterize as the unambiguous uh, pursuit of intellectual excellence, unambiguous, um, is not to be found everywhere. And um, it's really a, a central element of the university. Now, today is a little bit different, I think, because I've been asked to uh, comment on a number of things. So the role of NORC in the Project on Human Development in Chicago Neighborhoods, which I've been working on for quite a while, along with um, other colleagues, and, and just finished a book on that. But um, it's not a traditional talk. I mean, it's not, I'm not going to give you one finding. I'm not going to give you um, sort of the, the traditional layout. In fact, I don't even have a title. This is the title. It's, <laughs> it's blank, um, as far as I can tell, if this is, is working. And I know I stand between you and lunch. So um, what I thought I'd do is something um, a little bit different, and that is um, not go right to data, but to um, give you a sense of some of the animating questions um, that obsess me and have for a while. In other words, an overview of my intellectual uh, focus. So broad uh, view, really, um, sort of abstract view. And then elaborate briefly on principles of inquiry um, that generated um, the project and continue to drive the project. And then descend a little bit more into some examples of what that means for data collection. And in particular, highlight um, some of the role that, or the roles that Nork played in, in the data collection. And um, I was given, you know, as you would expect to do, you know, complete um, freedom here. They didn't tell me to, you know, not remark on the study with a 10% response rate. And, um, <laughs> Actually, it was a lot higher than that. But, um, so I guess I can do anything um, I want. And I, I will do that by trying to essentially embed the, the NORC study in, the, in this larger project. And it's also great, be, great to be back um, in Chicago. Um, I've been here for about a day, and, and the weather is, is worse than I remember. Um, <laughs> the people are better than I remember. So I think it evens out somehow. Um, and it, it's a great place to do research, as sociologists at the University of Chicago you know, discovered a long time ago. Chicago is the quintessential American city, uh, many have argued, and even more than that, um, 
even beyond social science, right? right? Liter literary scholars, poets, musicians, even in, whether insiders such as Saul Bellow, outsiders, Norman Mailer have declared it, um, Chicago is the great American um, city. And having lived in New York this year, I, um, I think that's true. New York is, uh, look, looks outward. It's, it's the world city, but Chicago, I think, is, is the great American city. As even the um, European historian uh, Tony Jute uh, remarked on in a wonderful ode to New York um, before um, he recently died. Some of you may be interested in that in terms of his assessment of uh, the culture of cities around the world. So um, with that in mind, let me um, sort of briefly um, give you a sense of um, the project in, in the book. In a nutshell, the guiding thesis in my book is the differentiation by neighborhood, not placelessness, as dictated by the globalization and other paradigms, defines the contemporary city. Neighborhood difference is not only everywhere to be seen, it has durable properties with cultural and social mechanisms of production and with effects that span a wide variety of social phenomena, whether it be crime, child health, protest, leadership networks, civic engagement, home foreclosures, teen births, altruism, collective efficacy or immigration, to, na to name a few topics that I investigate in the book. The city is socially ordered by a spatial logic. It is placed and yields differences as much today as a century ago. And I begin in chapter one with a, a visit to the Gold Coast and slum of Henry Zorba in 1929, which, by the way, he identified Death Corner on the near north side. And I end um, the book in the 21st century Gold Coast and slum and Death Corner. And it's quite remarkable both the continuities and changes that we see. The manifestations of difference change, in other words, but not, I argue, underlying process. Spatially inscribed social differences constitute a family of neighborhood effects. So I expand the definition of what are traditionally def defined as neighborhood effects. And I argue that they're pervasive, strong, cross-cutting, and paradoxically stable, even as they are changing in manifest form. Now, uh, let me just note a few sort of intellectual moves that I make in the book um, that contrast a bit, I think, with some of the current ways that we think about urban research. The first is to get out of the ghetto. What we might call the poverty paradigm has dominated the urban research agenda, at least since Wilson's classic, The Truly Disadvantaged. Concepts such as the inner city, underclass, and ghetto have dominated intellectual debate. While important, poverty is a relational concept that requires an understanding of the middle and upper echelons of society. Inner city poverty is no longer valid as a concept. Many of the poorest neighborhoods are in far-flung corners of the U.S., in the suburbs, um, note, the south suburbs of Chicago, or even further south or west. Yet the poverty paradigm has directed many surveys to focus solely on poor individuals and the majority of ethnographies on poor communities. Recent decades have seen a flourishing of excellent urban ethnographies, but virtually all of them are located in black or poor ethnic communities. That much of urban sociology is focused on the lives of the poor and downtrodden is striking in its implications. Neighborhood variations across the full range of structural contexts and social mechanisms remains a limited topic of inquiry. And I might say um, the study of power. Um, and one of my current interests, the next book is going to focus more on institutional inequality and power at the upper end. I thus move beyond the confines of the ghetto and focus on social mechanisms theoretically at work across a broad range of factors, such as informal control, network exchange, homophily, selection, and organizational capacity. I conceptualize a social mechanism as a plausible contextual process that accounts for a given phenomenon, taking its central goal, the, se the empirical study of the sources and consequences of social behaviors that vary across neighborhoods. So I take a comparative approach um, and try to counterbalance the focus either on single communities or snapshots of many communities at one point in time. So dynamic and comparative. Now, um, you know, there's been a lot written on social mechanisms for those of you that get in the weeds and that kind of stuff. And I'm not enamored of all of it. Um, but I do think um, we should also recognize that a focus on social mechanisms does not imply a neglect of cultural and symbolic processes. And it does not mean a search for universal covering laws. The approach 
that I take allows me to simultaneously approach what may be the most powerful role for neighborhoods in the contemporary city, perceptual or cognitive social organization. Neighborhood studies have often been conceptualized purely in terms of structural characteristics. They could be implanted anywhere. When social organizational factors such as networks or control are studied directly, they're often considered to be analytically independent from perceptions and interpretations that give them meaning. But as uh, another uh, University of Chicago scholar noted, Jerry Suttles and Walter Fiery before him, places have symbolic meaning as well as use value. They are interpreted and narrated. Tom Gurion, more recently, has argued that places are not just abstract representations on a geometric plane. They take on social significance through the interaction of material form, geography, and inscribed meaning. For example, when Mayor Daley II moved out of Bridgeport and up north, it was cause for a lot of hand-wringing in Chicago. It was in the papers. Lots of articles written about it. I found it quite amusing. But it wasn't just because of the race or working class composition of the communities. I think it had to do for what it stood for symbolically and politically. A concession, if you will, um, to the lakeside liberals on the part of Daly. Many other neighborhoods in Chicago, but also elsewhere, have distinct meanings. Beacon Hill in Boston, the Tenderloin in San Francisco, Hollywood, Bed-Stuy, Kensington in London, you name it, cities around the world. In short, people act as if neighborhoods matter, which is a fact of profound importance in the social reproduction of inequality by place. Consideration of both structural and cultural mechanisms is a central um, task I set out to address. Now, there's another piece to this. What has hindered the study of these kinds of social processes and cultural mechanisms? Theory plays a role because theory guides, in my opinion, the production of methodological tools and analytic approaches. Here's where sociology stumbled in the decontextualization phase of the mid 20th century, and I'm not the only one to argue this, um, some in this room, um, Jim Coleman and others, when I dare say the Chicago style tradition of research was overtaken by an increasing dominance of individual centered survey research and point estimates, and national samples and so forth. Not that they're not important, but they tended to elide a focus, I think, on context. Now, this dominance has been challenged, clearly. Um, certainly by ethnographers, but it persists despite the resurgence of interest in neighborhood effects. Not only does research continue to focus, again, largely on the ghetto poor or negative outcomes, it usually treats context as, in essence, just another characteristic of the individual, sort of tagged on to the individual. So we're starting to predict some individual outcome from some, oh, now let's add in a neighborhood characteristic. I think that's a, a very narrow way to frame the problem. We need to treat context as important units of analysis in and of themselves. Unlike individual measurements, which are backed up by decades of psychometric research, the underlying methodology needed to evaluate this is not widespread. And um, Steve Colleague, a, a dear friend and colleague um, here at Chicago and I, uh, proposed moving toward a science of ecological assessment, which we called ecometrics. And I build on that in this book. And You'll see a little bit of that with regard to the application to some of the um, field and, and survey work that was carried out um, by NORC. So I'll, I'll just hold that for a minute. Another move. The idea of ecometrics leads naturally to a further challenge, that of linking neighborhoods and places together in the social structure of the city. Prior research on neighborhood effects is focused largely on the idea of contained or internal neighborhood characteristics. This approach is a bit surprising, given, given that, uh, if you think about it, a workhorse of urban sociology is the idea of interdependence and spatial proximity. And indeed, there's been a lot of advances in spatial methods and lots of tools out there now in terms of um, analyzing um, spatial relationships. Um, but in, in a sense, that's still in the internal neighborhood framework in the sense that, and it's important, but it's the neighborhood of a neighborhood that matter. So it kind of ramifies outward, so you have the spatial linking pro process. But if you go back, um, I think it's fair to say that even Robert uh, Park and Ernest Burgess, even though they didn't actually analyze it quite like this, theoretically, they envisioned research on the ecological or social structure where neighborhoods were a piece, merely pieces of the mosaic of the city, 
The political economy critique made a similar point, as did social network theorists, of course. Um, this critique has been around for a while. Um, Non-spatial relationships are just as important theoretically as internal neighborhood characteristics. And then, of course, we have critiques that globalization and other big forces uh, matter as well. In fact, one, one of the critiques of neighborhood effects, just got an email the other day from Low Week, it's all state effects. You know, big globalization works down. That means it's more important. I think because it's big does not mean it's more important. It's mediated and has to be understood um, together. So how do we go about studying this? Therein lies the rub. Uh, what might be the biggest hurdle to neighborhood effects research is the simple fact that neighborhoods are themselves penetrated by multiple external forces and contexts. I don't solve this problem, but I try to address it a bit. And I would say that acknowledging this and studying it are two different things. Critiques of the Chicago School idea of neighborhood are legion, right? They're everywhere. But convincing empirical demonstrations of the effects of larger structures are thin, very thin. I would argue. There's a lot of talk, but very little actual research that, that shows how these larger processes work. It's, they're often assertions. Motivi motivated by this concern, I explore the implications of thinking in terms of interconnected and multi-level social processes, recognizing that these levels are, in ex to an important extent, um, themselves um, socially constructed. But they go beyond the idea of an isolated urban neighborhood. I examine this mainly through residential migration, organizational ties, inter-organizational ties, and elite social networks that criss uh, cross cut multiple neighborhoods, as you will see. These data permit me to address one of the more basic but untested propositions in the literature in which the unit of analysis is relations between and among um, neighborhoods. In other words, I examine the network structure of the citywide pattern and then link it to the internal characteristics of the neighborhood. So I reject, actually, the network idea that it's all, that the structure, that is, the relationships, are all that matter. That's wrong, too, I think. Another move is to reconceptualize, or at least think, try to think a little bit differently about individual selection. This is the bugaboo of social science research, so we think. Um, and you may think, based on what I've just said, that I'm a structural determinist. Whatever that means. I've been accused of that. So, I, But I'm not, actually. It, uh, individuals matter, obviously. Um, how neighborhoods change and how city dynamics are brought about are considered not just from structural view, uh, but also from you know, the top down, but also from the bottom up. Now, this has a long literature, those of you, uh, many of you out there are, are, are well familiar with all the literature now and uh, you know, levels and, and um, these debates. Jim Coleman. Um, who, of course, was a foundational member of the uh, University of Chicago Sociology Department and in Foundations of Social Theory, um, illustrated the idea of these multiple links. And if we um, simply apply this um, to neighborhood, we can think about the, the um, different levels at which we might uh, consider analysis. Let me say that I do not accept his underlying rational choice theory, nor do I accept the rigid strictures of methodological individuals. Now, I assume, particularly before lunch, we're not going to get into a talk on discussion of methodological individualism or analytic sociologists' latest claim for structural individualism, which I think is um, also flawed. Um, most research is actually kind of down here, individual level um, properties influencing individual level behavior. A lot of contextual research now in sociology, long tradition of research going back on um, rates of behavior and macro level relationships. And Coleman argued we really needed to work this all through and understand how individual actions create emergent structures. I think that's fair. Um, the problem is the context got uh, demoted, I, I think, a bit in the, in the move to analytic um, sociology, and their heart really is in um, the individual level. I don't, I, I'm not going to say more about this. Um, I write about it in the book. Um, but I do think that individual selection needs to be reconsidered. It's not a nuisance. It's not a bias. I mean, it can be depending on your question, but it's also a fundamental feature of social life. It's how social structures are created, and we should study them. And I study it through um, important processes such as residential moves, um, the selection of who to contact, for example, among elites, and how they generate upward um, consequences 
that ramify across the city. Okay. It was mentioned about data earlier, and you're saying, what happened to the data? <laughs> Ideas come first. Um, so let me just um, continue, but now start to move into um, <clears throat> this thing that's been hanging on my uh, back for, for over a decade. Um, but it's been a lot of fun. Labor of love. Um, and it's still going on, by the way, in a new form. I won't talk about it, but um, in collaboration with Rob Mayer um, and linking it to um, Los Angeles, because some people said, well, yeah, that's Chicago. What about LA? That's, you know, Sunbelt City, and it's different, and all this kind of stuff. So we said, well, fine. We'll look at that. And we are. Um, and we're following up the cohorts from the study. But let me um, tell you the principles and ideas behind this. Backed by over a decade's worth of um, research and original data collection, what I tried to do is to um, understand these contextual processes that I've introduced. And what unites all the chapters in the book is a concern with the social mechanisms and dynamic processes of place in the contemporary city, in this case, Chicago. The Chicago School of Urban Sociology, unabashedly, um, nourished me as a scholar and provides a grand tradition, but I try to uh, transcend it when needed. But I think there's certain principles, if you will, that um, guide the research. And I propose 10 active elements of what I view as a general theoretical approach to the study of neighborhood effects in the contemporary American city. I refer here not to specific hypotheses, but to larger, more abstract principles of social inquiry. They're operationalized and expanded on in the book. And each chapter takes on a specific um, idea and works through it empirically. One, relentlessly focus first and for foremost on social context, especially as manifested in urban inequalities and neighborhood differentiation. Two, study neighborhood level or contextual variations in their own right, adopting an analytic style of data collection that relies on multiple methods, but that always connects to some form of empirical assessment of social ecological properties accompanied by systematic standards for validation, ecometrics. And we've tried to work this out publicly in most of our data uh, we've made public. Three, across ecological contexts and guided by these ecometric principles, focus on social interactional, social psycho psychological, organizational, and cultural mechanisms of city life rather than just individual attributes or traditional compositional features such as racial makeup and poverty. Four, within this framework, integrate a life course focus on the temporal dynamics of neighborhood change and the elaboration and explanation of neighborhood trajectories. Key goal of the book. Five, invoke a simultaneous concern for processes and mechanisms that explain stability. As my colleague um, Orlando uh, Patterson um, has argued for quite a while, we, we focus so much on change but fail to actually notice that there's a lot of stability and we don't actually explain um, stability in many of our subfields. In other words, highlight forms of how neighborhoods are socially reproduced. Six, embed in the study of neighborhood dynamics the role of individual selection, decisions that in turn yield consequences for neighborhood outcomes. Treat social selection as a process, not a statistical nuisance. Seven, go beyond the local. Study neighborhood effects and mechanisms that cross or spill over local boundaries to, lear, to yield spatial disadvantages and advantages. Eight, go further still and incorporate macro processes beyond the influence of spatial proximity, building a concern with the social organization of the city or metropolitan area as a whole, integrating variations across constituent neighborhoods with what I refer to as higher order structures. Nine, never lose sight of the human concerns with public affairs and the improvement of city and community life. Draw implications for community level interventions, which I do in the last chapter of the book. 10, finally, emphasize the integrative theme of theoretically interpretive research while taking a pluralistic stance on empirical research and the nature of evidence. And I have a particular argument on what's happened in the social sciences in the causal uh, revolution and, and what kinds of evidence we can think about and, and what causation um, means today. The disjuncture that often exists between theory and empirical research, akin to the so-called two cultures problem of quantitative versus qualitative, 
never had much for us in Chicago, as um, social observers of the Chicago School, like Andy Abbott, have noted. And it should not today in the field at large. So these 10 principles now, abstract principles, entail, in, in a way, a, a, a modi operandi that I build on to infer from the Chicago School and then adapt to the contemporary social world. Theory and specific hypotheses, which then are um, confronting data and in an interactive fashion, um, working through to try to find an answer. So I guess I would say that my approach attempts to unite method and theoretical principle. Viewing theory, you know, I'm old fashioned in this sense, in its classic form, which I define as the analysis of a set of empirical facts in their relation to one another, organized by a set of guiding explanatory, explanatory principles, but also informing them. The specific theoretical claims are laid out um, in the book. So um, now to the data part. And I'm going to, you know, look, there's a lot of data, <laughs> um, 500 pages worth, if you want to read it, um, that I could go over, but I can, of course. So I'm just going to give you a highlight of, of the PhDCN, Project and Human Development in Chicago Neighborhoods. Ideas embedded in the title, context, development through time. Simplest way to think about it is two studies in one. We argue um, back in the very beginning, and I remember the, the community design was hatched in the Yale um, club in New York City, because Al Reese uh, at Yale University was one of the senior members of the staff, and we designed the community study basically on the simple argument that to understand individual development contextually meant that you had to independently assess and study the context within which they resided. We did that in several ways. Um, we carried out community surveys here in the city of Chicago. I'm not going to talk about them. Large scale study carried out by non-NORC. <laughs> um, this is lots of, we had our own data shop, App Associates was involved, NORC was involved. It was a huge data collection. There's about 9,000 people interviewed here. Um, systematic social observation. This was a NORC study, the yellow highlighted NORC, and the key informant study. I'm going to briefly highlight them. Systematic social observation, the idea was that, yeah, it's important what people say, what they think, but as social analysts, that's um, hardly enough. Um, another piece of information is what we can see, what we can observe, and then what people think about what we observe or what they observe, and trying to put that together. So we literally observed city streets and drove down the streets of Chicago, um, that is to say, Nork rented sport utility vehicles starting in 1995 with tinted windows with cameras mounted on both sides of the windows and two observers. And the observers coded on very detailed observer logs what they were seeing, what they were hearing. There was also an audio. I was going to play them for you, but it's kind of fuzzy. And they would, you know, say, hey, there's something going on in the corner that couldn't be seen. Um, but the beauty of videotapes is that they are essentially photographs, because you can stop and you get a picture that you have and can preserve. And we coded from that all kinds of things, right down to whether there are, we even coded whether there were uh, condoms visible on the street. I have pictures of those if you don't believe me. Um, <laughs> garbage, prostitution, drug deals, but also not just the negative, nice things, um, housing, structure, cars, you name it, what you can see. Um, key informant study is a study of what we might think of it as elites, the movers and the shakers. I'll show you who those were. And then we followed kids, 6,200 kids starting at birth, women who were uh, pregnant or enrolled, followed by three-year cohorts up to age 18. The eight, they are now, it's been, uh, you know, started in 1995. So um, birth cohorts are now becoming adults, They're important to study, and that's why I'm so excited about following them up. Important when I said out of the ghetto. This is the manifestation. All neighborhoods um, were subject to sampling. It's a stratified design. Low, medium, and high SES neighborhoods were sampled, probability, proportion, the representation, black, white, Latino, and mixed. So this is, you name it, black middle class, black upper class, working class white, just so you have the, a picture of that in mind. Now, OK. A couple examples. One um, chapter deals with a, a controversy, which I'm just going to highlight in the field, on disorder. 
um, and what it means. It's just a huge literature. It's an interesting literature. It goes way back, actually. Um, scholars of the city have long interpreted signs of disorder, or what we think is disorder, as ways that constitute powerful forms of differentiation. Um, from observers of London in the 1800s, such as Charles Booth and Henry Mayhew to Jane Jacobs' Death and Life of Great American Cities, the idea of um, differentiation is real. Um, I got this from the archives, the Booth archives. You can't really see it very well, but it's, it's kind of cool in the sense that in the 1800s, you know, Booth was painstakingly walking the streets of London, and by each block characterizing, yeah, that's great if you can, I think that will help, um, the, the nature of what he called the lowest classes and the squalor, and unabashedly, in fact, argued that the lowest class category was, quote, the vicious semi-criminal inhabited principally by occasional laborers, loafers, and semi-criminals, or, quote, the very elements of disorder. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. So that, you know, this idea has is, is been there for a while. Um, and you know it's real when um, the New Yorker imposes its humor um, on it. These are two women probably walking on the Upper East Side of Manhattan owning a, you know, the black cat and garbage can and a, a tattered um, window shade. This neighborhood is certainly going to pot. Perceptions of disorder um, are somehow powerfully in our imagination. Well, we basically, as I noted, engaged in 21st century style systematic social observation. 22,000 face blocks, and we did this in 1995, and it was followed up with a, another form of observation in um, 2002. Now, the Dominant frame is that signs of disorder or scenes like this in public spaces, much has been made of it. May lead to crime, may lead to health, poor health, migration, people may move out. And the broken windows thesis, probably I don't even need to describe it. Everyone knows what the broken windows thesis. This means that this kind of stuff leads you know, one broken window leads to another, one graffiti leads to another, and there's unraveling, and then there's more crime, and all kinds of bad things happen. Well, we've written on this. I'm not going to talk about it, but I'm going to talk about, actually, what might be more interesting, which is what is, what is disorder in the first place? What leads to our understandings of disorder? When do we actually see disorder or perceive disorder in the, in the collective perceptions and social meanings of disorder? And... Um, one of the, this is very oversimplified, but one of the things that we um, looked at was the, the perception of disorder or felt disorder and how it arises. And we have longitudinal data now through the follow-up, so I was able to look at this over um, multiple waves and actual, in quotes, measures of disorder. You know, I can get into lots of detail if you'd like in terms of measurement, models, and different types of disorder. But if you will allow me, and I'm happy to have you, you know, scour the details, but assume that we've measured this well, and, and I think we have. Um, and we can also measure an individual's personal history, not just their demographics, but their attitudes, their own um, social position, if you will, and the land use, and the poverty rate, and so forth. And what we find out is that there's some interesting um, patterns in the data that are consistent um, with not just the implicit bias literature, but the, the idea that certain places, particularly in a macro context, where inequality and urban change has led to certain assumptions that people make about the connection of disorder to specific groups, um, which historically is accurate to some fundamental level, then leads to, in a way, a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy where people act on those biases. And what's interesting is this holds for all groups. So for example, um, blacks and whites, um, first generation immigrants and third generation immigrants all are affected, for example, by the concentration of minority groups and um, immigrant groups. I think I may skip over this, but this is a slide from the book that shows the um, first generation immigrant and third generation immigrant. First gen generation immigrant, when you compare it within the same neighborhood, okay, within the same neighborhood, whites see more disorder than every other group. They perceive it so you're in the exact same context. Similarly, um, third generation compared to first generation see more. But when you look across neighborhoods, um, there's a main effect 
of immigration on perceived disorder, and this is not accounted for by other neighborhood characteristics. Perhaps more interesting is a between uh, community effect, um, and this <coughs> is a, based on a very complicated model, but I've tried to show it simply. And what it does is to take an individual's perception of disorder in the second um, wave, the longitudinal um, piece of the survey, and we take into account, again, age, social class, and race, and their perceptions, their interactions, their social networks, whether they have friends in the neighborhood, whether they um, you know, perceive other kinds of social qualities in the neighborhood. Just for that, then we take into account the neighborhood characteristics, the structural characteristics. And what this shows, and this is three factors in these lines that are comparing. One is the racial effect, which is the main effect of percent African American in the neighborhood on perceptions of disorder, which does not interact, just keep this in mind, does not interact with individual level race. So it's a, it's a main effect. And the race effect is basically these two lines compared to these two lines. The high observed disorder and high percent black. It's going off the screen a little bit, but if you get it. And, and I'm just doing um, this in um, low, medium, high, which are basically the uh, 25th percentile and 75th percentile. And the dotted line is for where we, we have high dis observed disorder, and this is low di disorder, conditional on the same racial composition. So what you can see is a relatively small and it's actually insignificant difference between measured or observable disorder, no matter which way you cut it, whether it's physical, social, bar, I mean, we, we, you know, we cut this a lot of different ways. Physical is not really having um, any relationship or nor at lower levels of um, percent black. The difference from here to here is the effect of socially perceived disorder. Now, what is that? That's defined as, remember, we have now um, a picture of neighborhoods over time, and one of the arguments is that the collective or socially perceived disorder is part of the reputational um, qualities of a neighborhood or the intersubjective agreement on perceptions of disorder, which is the largest predictor of an individual's over seven years later. And furthermore, note that these are different people. These are not the same people. So this is not being measured by the same people uh, on the outcome. And to go further in this, we also looked at perceptions of disorder among, and I'm going to get to it in a minute, the key leaders and informants in the community. And we even said, well, what about those that work in the community but don't even live there, so they have no prior inside knowledge. And it turns out that their perceptions of disorder are also driven largely by this intersubjective agreement among residents and socially perceived disorder. Now, I could go into this a lot more, but part of the argument here um, is really meant to portray some of the ways the data are used um, in terms of bringing together the perceptions, the measurable or observed disorder, and there's a lot of other things that I do, and, and I also look at the traditional broken windows thesis. Um, bottom line is I think it's right and wrong, and, and it's right in a paradoxical way, because the more we reinforce the idea that broken windows lead to decay, the more it leads to decay, because people and the media act on that. And that's a social effect. We often um, tend to overlook those kinds of, of mechanisms. And finally, and this is a little, I was almost surprised that this in a way, but this sort of cognitive um, perception um, in a way is fundamentally tied into inequality and this is the self-reinforcing idea. Because when we look at the trajectory of a neighborhood, and I present it here in a very simple way, which is predicting the future uh, poverty, that is socially perceived disorder 95, predicting later poverty, and these are real communities, and much of the book, by the way, is very contextual. Um, <coughs> And historical and gets into the sort of community-based approach to truly really understand these communities. This predicts the future rate, but what's important is the observed disorder does not, and this controls for prior poverty and other characteristics. So there's something going on, I argue, about the, the cultural and the social mechanisms surrounding the narratives of disorder, and it, it matters where disorder occurs. And 
you can even have disorder in certain neighborhoods and, and be successful. And afterwards, I'll tell you where that picture of uh, graffiti that I took was located. OK. Um, I think I still have a little bit more time, and I want to talk about another NORC component. So that was a, a NORC component of the study. The other, um, and, and I'm actually um, crazily um, hoping to write a book on, on this project um, now that I've finished off the, uh, the other one. And there's a chapter, there's actually two chapters that um, introduce this and get into some key findings. But um, I'm following this up, and I have also done interviews and, and plan to do more. But the, the central idea here is that we want to look at organizations and leaders, and they've been understudied in terms of getting things done, in terms of the social structure of the city, in terms of power. And if you think about it, some of the classic questions, not just in sociology, but in political science, have been left, I would argue, um, to the side. Um, questions that, that um, Dahl and Hunter asked, for example, in Who Governs, um, again, there's an analogy to what happened in sociology with the move toward individual um, point estimates that issues of more relational um, power, for example, in the political um, science arena, I think have not been fully um, studied. And this study is an attempt to get at that. The Key Informant Network Study, what is it? 1995, we went to a positional sampling frame and had lots of great advice here from people, Ed Lauman, who did work um, back um, with, with um, Pappy and others, and, and Norm Bradburn um, down the hall helped design the survey instrument, you may remember. And we defined positions, public positions, and then we sampled them with probability methods and then did a snowball sample on top of that. I won't get into the details. And then in 2002, and I think this was the innovative part, it's really a mover stayer model. We went back to the position. We interviewed the same position. If a new person's in, we interviewed them, we found out where the old person went, and so forth. So it's new positional leaders, re-interviews, or new organizations. And we refresh the sample, that is to say, with new organizations. I was kidding about the response rate. The, let's see, what do we have? 87% response rate we got in the first round, and 76% um, in the second round. So it was really, uh, it was a wonderful study to work on. It was one of my um, favorite. Goes, you know, driving down the van was fun, too. People didn't think we could do that because, you know, the interesting thing was people said we were going to get shot. The biggest risk was suffocating because it was so goddamn hot. <laughs> well, you remember 1995. Okay. You, have to, you have to be a Chicagoan to get that. So um, that's the basic um, scene. Um, these are the domains, education, business, religion, law enforcement, political, community organization. I think there's a, you know, we, we tend to think of elites as just those at the top, you know, the corporate <coughs> chieftain or Mayor Daley. Yeah, those people are important, but their power is um, dependent on these structures. So the parish priest, district commander, the alderman, community organization director, these are the people we talked to, 2,800 of them and, and over 1,000 in 2002. Now, quickly, um, lots of stuff here, but I want to just tie back now to some of the more abstract ideas I began with, which is the, the notion of trying to get at how relations unfold in the, in the contemporary city. These leaders are important in terms of the actions that they engage in and, and who they go to to get things done. We actually ask them specifically, um, not just what organizations they belong to, but um, the leaders of those organizations, who they knew, and specific people they went to um, to engage in getting things done. And it was not, we did not reify the outcome in the sense that it did not have to be within the neighborhood. And so we can derive then in, you know, sort of network lingo, um, different kinds of structures from this, from res how respondents are tied together, how alters are tied together, and interestingly, how organizations are tied, domains are tied, and then communities are tied. Now, this is a traditional you know, picture of a network. Um, this is in 2002. This is what the leader network looks like. Um, proportional, this is the vertex here is um, in degree. Um, so there is a, a sort of a Mr. Big, <laughs> if you will, uh, shall not be named. Um, no one will be named. Um, some people in this room may be here. Um, Certainly some key actors at the University of Chicago um, were in the 
study, and Hyde Park was actually a, a, one of the communities that was my local knowledge to verify whether this was working, and I, I really think it did. The um, yellow people around the edges um, are isolates. Now, not everyone has a contact, and we do not force that. And we do not ignore that information, because an isolate it leads to important information, and I'll show you in a minute. And others um, are quite tied, and you see cliques and so forth. But I'm interested in how this is embedded in the structure of communities in the wider um, city, and how domains are related. So one thing you get out of this, very simple, is first of all, how are the various institutional domains related? And some of this I think you would probably have predicted. Other things I don't think you would, and I didn't, and I'm not going to go into it in detail, but it certainly doesn't follow necessarily uh, organizational charts. Um, for example, there's a lot of talk and, and work in Chicago on education. The education domain is surprisingly isolated um, from other institutional domains, as is law, by the way, and there's a big move in terms of legitimacy and law, in terms of the, the religious realm, very little um, contact here. Basically, you have this sort of circle up here of community organizations, politics, which, by the way, the politicians are the smallest group. We saturated the political domain, not surprisingly. But it generates the most connections. And religion is really deeply embedded with politics. And, and partly what I'm looking at is what that means for various activities. Um, churches don't just do religion, believe me. Um, and what they do is very interesting um, and controversial. I don't have time to talk about that today. But here's just an example to show you how profound differences emerge when we then break this down and we say, okay, now let's look at how people are tied within different communities. This is South Shore. What we see are two cliques over here, another clique here, and lots of isolates along the edge. Here we see a fairly dense, or traditionally what you might think of as a cohesive uh, community. These are very different. Finding then between, vari between community variability in the network structure. Another finding which I think is interesting, um, I put some names on here, I thought you might be interested in Hyde Park. <laughs> um, high, as you might expect it is. Um, what I did here is to look at the um, the density of that network, but also taking into account um, higher order links or, or, or what is known as sort of path distance density. So if I know Ed, Ed knows Andy, Andy knows the provost. Um, these are multiple indirect links that we can then utilize perhaps um, to get things done and you know, technically you can get at this in terms of to what extent is the network um, reachable. And it turns out that when you do that, you get some really interesting findings that don't necessarily um, conform to, to what we think. I mean, s some do, like Hyde Park, you th we think is uh, organizationally active, and it is. But there are many communities up here, some of which are very diverse. And this is not a race or SES story. And what this line is, just to make sure you understand this, I'm just looking at now the structures of contact structure of contact across the city over time. This is a dynamic path. And it turns out, since it's a mover-stayer model, that there's a huge flow, so 60% replacement. So they're not the same individuals on average, but the structure is very stable. I looked at concentration and other measures. You know, you can do your, we can do our network, you know, aficionado debate. But let's just say that it's not dependent on the measure. So there's a structure to um, the positional uh, pattern. And um, I'm not going to show you a table. And by the way, the book has no tables. <laughs> All figures, even multivariate. Um, and when you put race and social class and other things in the uh, temporal or dynamic equation, it's absolutely insignificant. And the coefficient for um, the persistence of the key leader network structure changes not a bit when you control for race and class. So this, this is not. Um, you know, the poverty paradigm study. And I go on to show what are the consequences for some of these patterns, like the fact that Hyde Park has this incredible social capital, if you want to use that term. I don't a lot, but if we do, um, it seems to have consequences. And moreover, and I'm going to end on 
the idea, which was probably abstract to begin with. And that is, this is not just about communities. This is sort of trying to realize the, the, the vision, as I was mentioning. It goes back a long time, which I don't think empirically has, has really been realized, which is to say, OK, we have communities, but they're embedded in this larger structure. And here, how, this is what it looks like with regard to the, the key informant networks. So they're both internal and external ties. So this is just, and I didn't do this by volume, this is just to simplify. Um, the vertex here is proportional to out degree, the number of communities to which um, there are sending ties. Um, and I shaded it by income just to show you that it's, that's, it's, there's a modest relationship, but it's really not what's driving it. Furthermore, you see some communities like Hyde Park, um, the Loop, but also some that um, are a bit interesting. I have um, you know, analysis of this in the book that are, are, in a way, connectors. So in other words, just as there are indirect ties between people, then communities, some are isolated and others are being, um, in essence, or, or serving as mediators for certain kinds of social processes. And what I do in the book is to look at this, but then I ask, well, what is explaining some of these ties? And I look at another kind of a tie, and an important tie in urban change is migration. So if I move from Hyde Park to Lincoln Park, let's make a move from Lincoln Park to Hyde Park. That'd be a better move, right? Um, that's establishing a tie. And if you think about it, there's an analogy here in the migration literature. You think of Doug Massey's work on migration, and you think of, oh yeah, we have sending communities, we have receiving communities. But we have, this is true in the urban literature, um, although not looked at in, in the sense of mobility ties. So what I do then is utilize the longitudinal data on our families to follow people wherever they move in the United States. And then particularly within Chicago, looked at the flows, so it's really kind of a demographic flow model, and then compared the flows of movement to the networks of leadership ties. And actually, I think it's interesting that it's not the similarity in race, and it's not the similarity in income that explains the ties between communities, but the migration flows are highly significant in terms of predicting key informant ties, which I think has to do with informational contacts and spatial proximity matters. So even in our days of alleged placelessness, and you know, you can use the cell phone. Um, elites have all kinds of um, power to escape um, place, but it turns out that in practice, um, even spatial proximity matters. So that is just a flavor, um, I think, and I'm, I've probably um, gone over what I was asked to do. Um, you know, in a way, the book is trying to, to deal with these things, and, and again, I didn't solve the problem. It's just at least, you know, attempting to do it is better than not trying. Um, and so it's really about the spatial dynamics in these higher order structures, but they're totally interdependent with the individual selection and moves down here. Any move here is interdependent with the social composition of the neighborhood. I'm not saying neighborhood is the most important fact. I mean, that's not what the book is about. But it's certainly theoretically interesting, and it's certainly um, an emergent and important uh, factor in cities. And trying to put this all together um, is fun. And for those of you that want to read about it, um, it'll be coming out in the fall, University of Chicago Press. If nothing else, I guarantee that it will serve as a, as a good doorstop it, um, at 500 pages, it, it, I'm told that it will um, hold doors up to 25 mile an hour winds. <laughs> so, um, there you go. Thank you. Uh, I, I hope I didn't talk too long. <laughs> but if there's any questions, I don't know what this format is. I think we have time for a few questions. I have a mic here. If you need one. Yep. No questions? Yeah. I'm, I'm curious, um, particularly with social ties and migration, mm -hmm. in terms of now that I've left this community and I've entered another one, I, I've established a tie. Thinking about the dynamics of transformation in Chicago over the past 10 years related to public housing, some of these, if I've out-migrated and that location doesn't exist anymore, yeah. how does that work in terms of? Yeah, well, I mean, there's a lot of 
a lot in what you're saying. I mean, it's a good question in the sense that, you know, some people are moving out of communities. that are no longer communities. In fact, in, in chapter one, I start um, actually with a photo of um, a piece of land, uh, which was a former home of 35,000 people. And of course, this is the Robert Taylor Homes, which existed at one point in time and now is green grass. Um, and what's going on around there is being negotiated and, and you know, what becomes of it, I have my own predictions um, based on the nature, the history and the nature of the neighborhood's proximity to um, other factors. Um, Cabrini Green and the uh, near north side, which is the, um, literally was the death corner in 1929 for Henry Zorba, um, also has a similar um, situation in terms of teardown of housing. That's going to have a different outcome, I predict, because it's got a different kind of history, but also a proximity to, um, to wealth and to, quote, the Gold Coast, which makes it more in demand. Um, so the reasons for moving uh, and the, the ties between the different neighborhoods is one of the things that I look at and look at the similarity in neighborhoods based on uh, both the, the race and, and class, um, but also some of these more social um, qualities, if you will, the social climate of the neighborhoods. And it turns out that organizational factors such as the organizational density and the intersubjective um, agreements or the on social disorder, um, if you will, sort of agreements on, on the, the reputation. I mean, I think it's a proxy for reputation. It's not a direct measure, but nonetheless, where people um, seem to have high intersubjective agreements on disorder, similarities on that are are quite um, important in predicting migration ties. So there's something about the, the nature of similarity, um, both at the high and the low end. And I have a map that shows sort of high disorder flows and, and low, low disorder flows. Um, and I'm currently working on looking at um, sort of the off diagonal moves when someone's moving from, let's say, a, a, a low um, disorder neighborhood to high disorder neighborhood. Or um, you, you can think about upward or downward mobility, um, which I, I should just say as an aside, um, is an interesting basic test to, to some of the selection concerns, right? Because there's all, often this image that, well, the, and particularly in the, in the literature, um, the neighborhood effects, it's the single mom poor who chooses to stay in one neighborhood and the other moves to you know, a better income neighborhood. But when you actually look at the mobility tables, and thinking of mobility not as individual mobility, but mobility where the outcome is the context, um, it's a very interesting story. And, and basically, um, of course, uh, especially given the argument of the book, it's mainly on the diagonal, and the off diagonals um, are mainly, um, well, you, you get white um, advantage. So blacks somewhat more likely to, to be downwardly mobile, but given um, secular changes, and um, I try to examine that, but predominantly the flows are horizontal. So people are moving into similar types of neighborhoods even though they may be moving. And that's an important point because when you look at it, there's a lot of churning. And so in other words, something like 45% of the people are moving within that context, but they're, they're churning basically within a relatively small um, geographical area and certainly within a similar social type of area, which says a lot then about what it means to take into account um, selection. So anyway, I, I understand your question to really um, take on a lot of different issues with regard to um, studying mobility. So there's no, there's no one easy answer to that. Yes, yeah, Mark. Well, what, let's take racial integration. In Chicago, but this is not a city that is notorious for having stable, racially integrated neighborhoods, Hyde Park does. Um, why? Well, as I think I said in the book, you know, not every neighborhood has an institution like the University of Chicago to promote or to underwrite um, in, in multiple ways, not just you know, directly integration, but the kinds of activities that lead to integration. And by the way, the kinds of ties across communities, like if you look like what's happening in Woodlawn, I mean, if you, a few blocks south of here, right, it looks like suburbia. You know, new homes going up, and um, it's all pretty, and I 
Uh, we spent a fair amount of time investigating that, at least the, the eastern part of Woodlawn. The western part is still dicey, but um, that has to do with the University of Chicago connections through the city. So it's multiple actors. It's, it's a regional network um, tied into this uh, more citywide network on economic development and housing. So yeah, institutions matter, but they um, don't necessarily... Uh, it's kind of like the idea that there are multiple pathways to this. So if you take another neighborhood like Beverly, which is also relatively integrated and stably, so doesn't have a University of Chicago to sustain it, but it does have, um, and this comes up and I show it on our measures, very high um, levels in that case of collective efficacy, which is resident-based um, involvement in the community and organizational participation. So there's almost an offset. So there's an, there's an organizational life there when it doesn't have the institution. And there's another, just to add on to this, a complication, which is that um, the nonprofit organization scene is not the same as the um, resident-based um, collective civic engagement. They don't necessarily go together. This is sort of a paradoxical finding. In communities where you have high nonprofit density, you often have this more external view and I find that when you look at the between community ties or in technical language the, the bet betweenness um, ties are driven um, by the attribute of the, the community in terms of nonprofits whereas a lot of communities like Beverly and, and, and Hegwish and, and Clearing which have high rates of uh, sort of internal resident based black advocacies tend to have a different, you know, the nonprofits are not necessarily all that high and they're more, it's more of an internal focus. And I think it has to do with the challenges that the, the, the neighborhoods face, but also the presence of institutions. So yeah, um, I think it matters and I, um, I try to take that into account. And um, Hyde Park actually conforms theoretically to that in terms of its um, organizational life, the density of its organizational life that comes out in the data, but also the nature of the ties among its elites. But so there's, but there's other things like racial integration, like, um, um, you know, depending, the needs of the communities vary, of course, and, and as do the resources that they have. I think there was another question in the back. And? Rob, what about the ties that have to do with the communities people work in as opposed to the places where they live? Yeah, so the um, key informant study, just go back to the design. So we, we started with position. Um, so you're the alderman or you're the University of Chicago um, vice president for community affairs. It was in our study. It was, not now. Um, now, I use those two examples because one probably lives in the community. Let's say Hyde Park and Alderman may not live in the community. So um, it turns out that, I mean, there's a lot of different ways to answer the question because it depends on you know, what thing I'm looking at. But it turns out that the structural characteristic of whether or not the leader lives in the community makes a difference. So um, for example, in terms of the ties, so if you take simple density of ties, um, it's positive, which is, um, makes sense. And, and it's kind of like the old um, systemic um, you know, model of Sergeant Janowitz in the sense that Again, we're not resident-based ties, but when you're thinking about ties, they're now about these more elite or political matters that residence or tenure, a simple fact of or proximity, um, does have this positive relationship. Um, the other thing, um, so what I do is to break it out by that or, or continuing to do that, because a lot of these analyses are in progress for um, hopefully, um, you know, more another book, but. Um, the other thing is to look at the ties in the, in the perceptions of the leaders, let's say, and I, I alluded to it before, that the perceptions leaders have that aren't in the community do, do differ. So what I think is really interesting, but I haven't analyzed it yet, is how the perceptions then are connecting to their actual network ties. And so I'm currently looking at that. Although I have already looked at the perceptions of disorder from those that live um, in and without. And then furthermore, I want to look at the uh, breakdown of what kind, because I think it really matters, the community organizational dimension versus the po political dimension. And I think th they really break out differently, and especially the religion one, which is fascinating. Um, I didn't have time to get into it, but the religion, it's, I mean, it's just going against the grain of a lot of the popular, you know, let's just bring everybody together and trust. I mean, the, 
show you the trust. Um, actually, this is charged in the book that um, the lowest levels of trust in Chicago um, are in the communities that have the highest um, density of churches. Yeah. <laughs> you, can have, you can spin a theological story. Um, you know, it's about the other world, so why should we trust our fellow man? <laughs> Makes sense. But it, 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 I think it goes beyond that, and it also bears on a lot of the narratives about, well, um, the churches have moral authority, and given the civil rights movement, collective action, that they are really the locus of um, support in the community. And actually, that's not true in many of these communities. There's a lot of distrust among community groups that feel like the elite uh, of, among the, and it's not every community, but the elite uh, religious leaders have these ties to um, citywide officials, not to mention national officials, um, but the, the residents feel like they're not um, really for them. And in fact, if you, if you take um, Woodlawn, I mean, this may go against the UFC green, but um, some feel like those new houses, which look great, um, are perhaps being bought by people that are moving in from outside the community, are not serving those from within. And so whether the, you know, it goes back to your point, so whether the, the informants or the leaders are you know within or without makes a difference in terms of their stake and identity with that community. So a lot of that work um, will still um, is still to come, although the, the structural variations in terms of the, of the proportion that live in does have the effect on the ties in the way that I stated. I'm just Done. curious about oh, the... Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. I'm um, just curious about your next work when you're going to be working with Bentley and Chicago together comparing the two. Are you going to be able to collect the same kind of rich data doing community surveys and key informant interviews? And um, well... It's only so many hours in a day, but um, the, the advantage of the LA study, and the reason I'm collaborating with them is that in the design of the Los Angeles Family Neighborhood Survey, we went out to LA and the PhDCN question, not all, but a core set were adopted, in our, they used um, and replicated of our key measures. So there's a, a certain kind of design that was set at the beginning that's never really been realized. And now with Rob Mayer, we're designing an identical um, structure of a follow-up and survey instrument. Doesn't have this key informant yet. I'm looking for a, you know, a benefactor. <laughs> so, Gates in the audience? No. Um, so I will you know, have to do that. But we do have money to, to um, carry out the follow-up of the the families, which is really important, no matter where they live in the United States, including, you know, I have a map of, you know, Mexico, Europe, and, and you know, so we, we follow them and we're going to go after them no matter where. Um, and there's a systematic observational component and a, a hybrid key informant piece in LA that we're going to collaborate on. Um, and again, the interesting thing about this is you have this alleged, you know, very different place, city. I mean, it is. Of course it is. God, you know, go to LA, it's, yeah, it's different, it's not Chicago. But we don't actually know, really, what the fundamental processes are like in terms of, I mean, we do know that segregation is pretty high there. Um, the ethnic groups vary, I mean, it's, you know, obviously in terms of the um, migration, and it's not as large as an African American population, and you know, it's not a, kind of a three model uh, city like it is here. Um, but in terms of the fundamental social processes, it's, it's an interesting um, test bed. That's the way I do it. One more question. Did, did you tell us where the photo was? The photo was up? Hyde Park, of course. <laughs> <laughs> it's art. It's not graffiti. <laughs> <laughs> it verifies my thesis. <laughs> so, so